Good morning. Good morning. Uh, a familiar but an unfamiliar face this morning up in front of you. So I was excited when I saw Josh and Micah taking down the, uh, the partition here, but then I also remembered that we're having a potluck today and I don't have a barrier if you guys decide you don't like what I'm saying and you're throwing fruit and vegetables up here at me. So I'll do my best to keep you entertained as we, as we talk through um, some pretty important things this morning. But most importantly, it's, it's my hope and it's my goal this morning that I speak nothing but the truth to you and that you're edified by being here this morning. Uh, for those of you that uh, are visiting, um, obviously what I'm alluding to here is uh, I'm not the normal preacher. Nate is out, and um, I just wanted to take a moment before I got into the lesson to say thank you for your kindness and your warmth here at this congregation. We have had the pleasure of getting to meet many of you and get to know you fairly well, and uh, you've invited us into your homes. Um, and you have uh, included us, and it's a pretty wonderful thing when you've moved as much as we have over the past 21 years this year. We're celebrating our 21st, 21st anniversary, actually May this, this year. So 21 years, 15, 16, 17 moves, I don't know how many it's been, but the one great thing is everywhere that we've been able to, uh, to move to, there's been a congregation that uh, has made us feel welcomed at an, and at home. And you guys have certainly done that. So um, may God continue to bless you all. And, and uh, just wanted to make sure that you understood how thankful we are moving to a new area that we very much appreciate having brothers and sisters with like minds. Um, also, while we're saying thanks this morning, I want to say thanks to Micah. Thanks to Darlene and Josh. Thank you for setting things up. Uh, most of us who don't do this every Sunday don't recognize and uh, don't appreciate how much work goes into uh, getting ready. And that obviously includes Nate as well as he prepares um, every Sunday to, to, to lead us in, in thought. So you see the, uh, the slide up above is our compass. And what I want to talk about this morning uh, is something really more for, for my kids, so I'm hope, I hope that they pay attention this morning. Um, but it's a great reminder as well to all of us um, as, we, as we go through this life, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that can distract us. Um, and so uh, finding or navigating to the narrow path is, uh, is a difficult thing. It is a very difficult thing, especially in the world we live in today. So since, um, since I was a child, I've had a love for exploring, probably one of the reasons why we've moved as many times as we have. So I'm sorry to my wife for, for putting up with it, but she's pretty adventurous too. She's put up with me for a long time moving around. Uh, since I was a kid, um, going out into the forest and looking around and seeing what I could find was always, uh, was always a great thing. It was a, 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 I mean, you grow up on a farm and there's not much around you. You, you figure things out to do to entertain yourself. Or you get in trouble, and uh, trouble's not a lot of fun, is it? So what I'd like to do is, is uh, I like telling stories, and I like being told stories. I think parables in the Bible are pretty, pretty fantastic things. So by no means am I telling you a parable this morning, but I'm, I'm going to set the stage for the rest of the, the lesson this morning. So, my family and I, we, uh, we arrive at a, a great big forest. Um, the kids are reluctant, and they're tired of me dragging them around, but we, we come upon this huge, big forest, and it's, uh, it's intimidating. It's like, how are we going to get through this? How are we going to find our way? And uh, as we look closer, we see a little a path, an opening through the forest there. And as we get closer, we see a sign that, uh, that Robert Allen left for us this morning, or today, for the, for the sign. And the sign says, hello, traveler. This forest looks intimidating, but I've walked it before. And I know how to get through it. So take the path before you and head west, and then you'll head south. 
and I've left this compass for you, and I've left a few lights along the right path because there are so many trails out there that will get you lost. The path can be rough, and it's easy to stumble, so don't rush. There are a few places where you'll be walking a very narrow ledge, but if you take your time and you walk one foot in front of the other, you'll be just fine. I hope to meet you on the other side of your journey. Matthew chapter 7 and verse uh, 13. If you want to turn there, I'll be referring to that some this morning. Matthew 7 and 13 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So let's talk for a minute about a compass. So Robert left us a compass to find our way through this big, intimidating forest. What does a compass do? Well, it utilizes a fixed point to indicate a direction. It provides the user with an understanding of their relation to that fixed point, and users can orient themselves with a compass to navigate or find their way. Why is, why is that important? Well. When uh, you've never been there, um, it helps you to know where you're going, helps you to know where you've been, helps you find your destination. And I'm sure as many of you have done before, long road trips or searching or, or hiking or whatever it is that you're doing, um, when you get lost, that's a little bit stressful, isn't it? And it's not a lot of fun. So it improves your trip. It helps you get to your destination without a, a lot of trouble. So are we on the right path or the wrong path? Well, the right path gets you through the forest to your destination. So if we, liber if we listen to what Robert left for us there on the sign and what he gave us, then we know uh, we'll be on the right path. But the wrong path leads you somewhere else than where you want to be, right? That's your destination. That's where you want to be. There we go. The narrow path is hard. It can be hard for some to find, many to follow, and it's difficult. I'm sure some of us have seen that. Those that are on the path, it's difficult for them to continue until they reach their destination. Some get lost along the way. So many things make that path difficult. And that's what I want to focus on this morning, is what is our compass, and how do we find the narrow path? Well, with that, that compass, we need something that's unfaltering, that's constant, and that's clear. <clears throat> Hebrews 13 and verse 8 says, How does Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever? Isaiah Chapter 40 and 28 says, Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. Can you imagine trying to navigate a big, dense, dark forest that you've never traversed before with a compass that constantly changes? It would be difficult if not impossible. There are many things that, that make finding and staying on the narrow path difficult, but I'd like to focus on really one. It's a pretty broad subject, but I think you'll get the, uh, the gist. I'd like to focus on influence and who we allow to guide us and what we allow to guide us. There seems to be an almost infinite number of opinions, positions, and attitudes expressed by many. All those ideas represent forks in the road that lead to a wide path where no one is wrong, everyone has their own truth, and what seems to be okay changes from day to day. 
In Matthew, the seventh chapter, as we've already read in verse 13 and 14, Christ warns us of the wide path that leads to destruction, and he admonishes us to follow the narrow path that leads to life. And I do not believe that what's recorded in the next section of verses there in Matthew chapter 7 is happenstance. I believe he shares this warning with us on purpose. In verse 15, we pick back up with, in Matthew chapter 7, Beware of false prophets who come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. The people of this world, and what do I mean when I say that, the people of this world, the people who are not guided by the word, who do not have the fear of the Lord within their hearts. The people of this world may seem good intentioned. In fact, some of what they're saying may be truthful. But we know how the deceiver works, don't we? He mixes truth with lies. And when you have no compass, you're guiding your own steps, and your path seems right to you. Make no mistake. These companies that are listed on the slide here in front of you have studied human behavior, brain chemistry, and they've placed a massive amount of resources and time and effort into how to influence users and viewers. It's no different. It's no different with the news. They use aggrandized titles and overblown stories to grab your attention, and then they try to hold it. So listen, I, I'm, I'm all about tools, and I'm all about progress and making things easier. It's one thing I learned working on a farm is that uh, you use, you work smarter, not harder. And in and of themselves, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, the news that we watch, in and of themselves, there's nothing wrong with that. But we have got to be mindful of the message that's shared there. And we've got to be mindful of who has what agenda. And the folks, the news, the, the users, the influencers that are on these, these different social media platforms, they have an agenda. They, they have an agenda that, that leads to a personal end or their own personal desires. Judges, the 21st chapter and verse 25, reminds us that in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It's a good reminder that uh, today is not the first day or the first time that we've had people who want to do what they want to do. We have this, this problem we're facing is nothing new. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. In this section of Proverbs, Solomon is comparing the righteous to wickedness and their choices. Make no mistake, God has an agenda as well, but is singly focused on our salvation. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. That's pretty wonderful, isn't it? And it should be comforting to every single one of us. I wonder if we got down to the brass tacks, as they say, if those influencers and those users, if that is their true motivation, the news that we watch, if that is their true motivation that is recorded for us in Jeremiah chapter 29. Here's one question to ponder, to think about. 
when everyone's right, does that mean that we're all wrong? Let's think about the path and the forest again. A different path, um, or walking on your hands, or just sitting down and saying, I'm not doing the path at all. That does not get you to your destination, does it? So, for instance, we're sitting there, getting ready to go down the path, and uh, my son Arden, who is uh, often likes to challenge things, and he likes to challenge himself. He says, Dad, I don't, you know, I know what Robert said, but I don't, I don't think that's right. I'm going to walk on my hands the entire way. Or my daughter, who uh, fa is famous for her cartwheels in the past. I don't know how many she did. One time it was like a hundred and something in a row. I don't know how she didn't throw up. But she says, Dad, that seems really boring. Walking one foot in front of the other, I'm going to do cartwheels the entire way. Or you may have someone who says, they see another path and they say, well, this one's nice, but that looks better to me. Who knows, it might be fool's gold that's on the other end of that. Much of what we see is based in the here and now, with little thought to what's most important our eternal resting place, our salvation, our soul. Conservation of the planet, treatment of animals, our veterans, equal rights, economic future. There are things that are important in this life. There are responsibilities that have been given to us by God in this creation, but none are more important than our salvation. So as you listen to these people on YouTube or Twitter or you watch the videos that they put out or what the news puts out there, I'd like you to think about that verse in Jeremiah 29. So your reaction to the scriptures here determines the path that you're on. And I know that seems... Um, like a fine line that I'm setting there, that you're either here or you're there. But that's the way it is with God. There is no half measures with Him. So let's read through a few scriptures, and let's evaluate a couple of reactions to each of those scriptures. I'd like, to, like you to be thinking about this this week. I know I certainly will be. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 9 through 11 and 13. It says, in addition to being a wise man, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, and he pondered, searched out, arranged many proverbs. The preacher sought to find delightful words to write words of truth correctly. The words of the wise man are like goads, and masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd, and the conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. Those that are on the narrow path will probably hear that scripture and say, based on, I will live based on truth and the fear of God, or in other words, respecting God and keep his commandments. The world who's on the wide path, will probably respond to that by saying, I'm a wise man and you can't dictate to me what's right. John chapter 14 and 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Those that are on the narrow path would respond to that by saying, there is but one way. Those that are not on that path, would say, the world has changed. That's not true anymore. My way is right too. Second Timothy 4 and verses 1 and 2. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. 
what those that are on the narrow path would say is regardless of what is in season or what is popular, I will speak the truth. Those that aren't would say, what you say offends me and therefore it is wrong. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, that is, it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Narrow path. My path is the one that God directs, And I will do my best to have repentance in my heart when I step off that path. Those that aren't on the narrow path would look at that notion in Romans, the first chapter, and say, what a silly and old-fashioned notion. doesn't apply anymore. Finally, Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 23 and 24. I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man who walks to direct his steps. Correct me, O Lord, but with justice, not with your anger, or you will bring me to nothing. My path is the one that God directs, and I'm sorry, I already read that. I skipped over. My apologies. You get the point, though. That there is, a, there is a reaction to the scriptures that either embraces and understands and is thankful for the knowledge that's been left for us, or there's one that reacts poorly. So with that, that's all very nice, Wes. You're giving us this, uh, this lesson this morning, but we don't live in a bubble. We don't live just with God's word. So what I'd ask is then, who in your life Do you choose to direct your path? Do you choose the word? Do you choose elders in the church? Do you listen to the preachers in the church? Do you listen to upright brothers and sisters? How do you know what's true about what they say? Because we've got to be mindful of that as well. Their guidance will be aligned with God's word, and that won't change because, as we've already read, there is no changing with God or with Christ. There's no need to change. John chapter 15 and verses 1 through 5 says, I am the vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You have already been clean because of the world which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither Can you, unless you abide in me? I am the vine, you are the branches. And he who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So that's how you tell. You pay attention to the fruit that has been born by those around you. And that's how you know who you should be listening to. The wide path, social media, Do you allow those influencers to dictate your path? Do you allow the news outlets? I'll tell you, this past election, um, I was paying way too much attention to the news, and it was getting me mad, and it was getting me frustrated, and finally I said, enough's enough, and I shut the stuff off. Those with worldly goals, as we've talked about, do they have Jeremiah chapter 29, and verse 10 in mind. Are they thinking the same way that God thinks? And even those who've been deceived, there are great people out there who have great intentions, but they've been deceived. Are you listening to those folks? Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 17 through 23 says, So this I say, and affirm together with the Lord, that you who walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity. 
with greediness. But you do not lean, learn Christ in this way. If you indeed have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. So how do you compare their words and how do you know when they're not true? You have to compare them to what the word of God tells us. Is it contrary to his word? Also, when anyone changes positions and can't give a reasonable explanation as to why that aligns with the word, then you should look elsewhere for guidance. Last couple of slides, I promise, I'm almost done. For those of you that are suffering, I'm about to put you out of your misery. So how do I use my compass? It's a lot of scriptures, Wes. It's a lot of things to ponder. Well, let's get down to application, because to me, that's where it matters, is making application. So how do I use my, my compass? 1 Timothy 4, and verse, verse 15 says, Take pains with these things. Be absorbed by them, so that your progress will be evident to all. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Psalms 119 and 15 says, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your way. Philippians 4 and 8 it says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if, these, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Galatians chapter 5 and 22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So how do I use my compass? The answer is you use your compass, right? You pick up the word of God, you let it guide you, you let it help you make decisions. And talk to those who have walked the same path before you as we started out the sermon talking about what Robert left for us, the sign that he'd already been through that forest and already knew the path. Godly family, friends, and members of the church, they will have your best interests at heart. And God's love demands that we help one another. We're all on this path through life. As the scriptures have told us, there are few who find the narrow path. Unfortunately, there are many who are directing their own steps and will continue to travel down the broad path until they reach a destructive end. But I won't leave it there. Here's the great news. Here's the great thing. God has an agenda. He wants everyone to be saved regardless of what their disposition is, regardless of their socioeconomic status, no, regardless of what the color of their skin is, he wants everyone to be saved. And he gave his son to do that, as Robert talked about this morning as we gathered around the table. I'd ask that this week you pay attention to your compass and what's influencing you, and that that does not lead you to leave the narrow path, but it encourages you to think about that narrow path and helping others find their way as well. Are you taking those actions? Am I taking those actions? Some days I don't. Sometimes there's been instances where I've made a mistake and I have probably led someone down the wrong path because of that. Have repentance in your heart, as David did, a man after God's own heart. Have that repentance and think about how you can help others who are being influenced by all these other things and are leaving 
the word. They're leaving God out of nearly every decision that they make. It's a path that, while they, they may enjoy the things in this life, there is another life that's coming. And the path has already been laid for us. It's one that we can follow pretty easily if we have the right heart, if we're willing to accept what God has said and what he's left for us and the examples that he's left for us in his word. So as is customary, I'd open the uh, invitation to anybody that needs the prayers of the congregations or others that you would want to lift up in prayer. Uh, we ask you, uh, if uh, we can help you at this time, that you come forward as we stand and sing. Mm -hmm.